Today we're going to take a look at calculating financial ratios. Uh, this is the second part of it. Obviously, in the previous lesson we talked about uh, some other ones, such as the current ratio, the return on sales ratio, and the uh, debt to equity ratio. We'll cover those again, uh, but this is more of a more in depth look at these ratios, and these are ratios that are commonly found on the balanced scorecard approach, uh, both the financial and the internal perspective. So, first one we want to take a look at here is we want to take a look at the quick ratio. And what the quick ratio is is the cash plus short term investments plus receivables divided by current liabilities. As you can see in the blue here, I kind of highlighted the uh, cash and accounts receivable from the current year. The left column is the current year. Um, those are current. Those are those are. Those are our current liabilities. Notice we're not incorporating inventory. Uh, inventory is not incorporated in uh, the quick ratio, uh, but it is more in the current. So, it's so the quick ratio will be a little bit of a lower ratio than the current ratio. But then I'll divide that by our current liabilities, as I've indicated here. So basically, I'm going to take my 13200 plus 2400 or my cash plus accounts receivable. I'm going to divide that by my accounts payable, salaries payable, and dividends payable. I get 1.85. Well, what does that mean? It means that Swanson Inc. in this example had a dollar eighty-five of liquid assets for every one dollar of current liabilities. In other words, they do have enough money uh, to pay their short-term obligations, which is really good uh, when you're analyzing a business and seeing if they debt. Um, once again, though, all these analysis must be um, compared to previous years, compared to industry, um, to their, but higher is better, obviously, in that uh, quick ratio. So now we'll take a look at the current ratio, and the current ratio is exactly pretty similar to the quick ratio. The difference between current ratio and uh, quick ratio is the fact that current ratio will inco incorporate inventory where quick doesn't. So it's going to get us a little bit of a higher number, um, but it's re basically recording how, how our ability to pay our short-term obligations. So our current ratio is going to be our cash plus our accounts receivable plus our inventory. And we're going to divide that by our accounts payable, salaries payable, and dividends payable. We'll get a number of three. Now you'll notice with the addition of that inventory from that quick ratio, we do get a higher ratio, which means they have $3.96 of current assets for every $1 of current liabilities. Uh, why is it higher? Because we have inventory. Now if it's an item that is a lower price item, such as uh, a candy bar, um, you know, that's, that's not a a bad thing. Um, and they're going to have that higher uh, current ratio, and that's a good thing to look at. If it's a car, you know, that's not going to sell as quick, and so that's, that's one of the things we want to take a look at. Next, we'll take a look at our gross margin ratio, and our gross margin ratio is basically our gross margin divided by sales. So to find our gross margin, and basically our gross margin is our sales minus our cost of goods. So our gross margin in this example is 91200 It will be oftentimes stated on a on a uh, income statement for you. You just have to look for it. If not, if it's not stated, just take the sales minus cost of goods sold. Sometimes you'll see it listed on the on your financial statements as cost of revenue, um, but it's still the same. Gross margin should be there. And we're going to divide that by our sales. So we're going to take our, our gross margin, which is 91,200, divide that by 240,000, which is 38%. Well, what does it mean? For every $1 of sales, 62%, 62 cents is the cost of the product sold and 38 cents to, to cover the other expenses and generate net income. Not doing a bad job. Um, obviously, you're, they're turning in 38 cents um, to cover their other expenses. So doing well. Uh, obviously, higher is better, but you have to compare industry. The next one is your return on sales ratio. We're going to take our net income and we're going to divide that by sales. Net income will be found on our income statement and our sales will be found on our income statement. So our net income is in this case is 12250. We're going to divide that by our sales which is 240. So our return on sales is 5.10%. Well, what does it mean? Well, it means in this case they generated uh, 5 cents of profit per every $1 sold. Not bad. Now, the thing that you have to realize is if you're selling on a $10 pizza, that 5 cent profit that's going to add up to a couple dollars. Okay, so you have to understand what's your average cost of goods, what's your average uh, retail selling price, and then take that, multiply that to find out really what their profit is. And once again, these are all ratios that any publicly traded company, you can go in there and you can find and you can determine for every company, which is kind of neat. Next one is our return on investment, the ROI ratio. You hear this one quite a bit, and that's pretty much your net income divided by your average total assets. Well, your net income, we're going to take our net income from our income statement, and we're going to divide that by our average total assets. Now, if you notice up on our balance sheet here, we do have total assets listed, but there's two columns. The two columns is year one and year two. Since it's an average total assets, we're going to take both of those, and we're going to divide those by two. So add them up, divide by two to get the average total assets. Uh, so our return on investment ratio, 
ratio is 1250 divided by 206 uh, plus 189,600. Divide that those numbers by 2 because we're getting the average total assets, and we get 6.19. Well, what does that mean? Swanson Inc. earned $6.19 for every $100 investment in assets. So in other words, when they invest in an asset such as uh, a plant, uh, such, a, such as a equipment, such as a, a building, how much is that really relating and turning into sales? Well, for every $100, that's six nineteen for every asset. Um, that's that's a real good ratio. Obviously, higher is better. You want to compare it to industry, but you are looking at a at a very solid return on investment. That means they're spending their money wisely when they're investing into the business. Next one is our return on owner's equity ratio. And what that is is our net income divided by our average owner's equity. That's our average owner's equity again. Uh, your net income in this case is on our income statement at 12250 We're going to divide that by our common stock, which is the average. In this case, both years it was 48, or both time periods rather, it was 48000 So 48000 you know, divided by two, um, it's going to be forty-eight thousand. But we take our retained earnings as well. So our average owner's equity. Careful, careful, careful. A lot of students like to take the two hundred six from the total liabilities and stockholders' equity. Remember those first two words: total liabilities. That's not what we're concerned about. We're concerned with our average owner's equity. So that'll be found by looking for the common stock and retained earnings. So our return on owner's equity ratio is going to give us a ten point eight seven percent. Basically, what it means is for every earn ten dollars and eighty-seven cents for every hundred dollars invested by owners. So in other words, this is a great one to look at. Uh, how well is the company using the money that investors put into the company, whether it be shareholders, um, you know, or just flat out owners of the company. And in this case, they're using it very well. So another one, moving on, debt to equity ratio. It's our total liabilities divided by our total owner's equity. Once again, our total liabilities. Now notice it doesn't say average, so we're going to use our current year. In this case, it's that left column. Uh, it's our accounts payable, salaries payable, dividends payable, and long-term notes payable. We're going to take that and we're going to divide that by our total owner's equity. Once again, we found that last one, knowing that our owner's equity can be calculated by using the common stock and retained earnings. So in this case, we get a 0.64. And basically what does it mean is Swanson Inc. has, has 64 cents of current and long-term debt for every $1 of shareholders' equity. And, and what this comes down to is is how heavily financed is the company on the the, the owners. Uh, is it using more of its cash asset or is it using more of the liabilities? Um, in, in this case, they're using a little more of their liabilities than they are of their own equity. Uh, accounts receivable turnover, how fast are they getting, basically how fast are these companies getting received the cash that they are owed to them. So we take our sales divided by our average accounts receivable. So once again, we have our sales, which is on our income statement, which is 240000 And our average accounts receivable, two years, we take the 24.9 plus the 23.400. We're going to divide that by two, and that gets our average accounts receivable, and that gets our turnover of 9.937 times. That means that it turns over 9.937 times. Well, in order to find the total days in the collection period, we take that number, we take 365, divide that by our accounts receivable turnover number, so it's 36.73 days in the collection period. Well, what does it mean? It means that it takes Swanson Inc. on average 36.73 days to collect its accounts receivable from its customers. That's a real good thing. Want to take a look at its uh, terms it grants. If it's granting net 45, it's great. If it's, gra if it's granting um, net 30, it may want to rethink about it because it's not receiving those terms in time. So. Uh, next, we have our inventory turnover. How quick do they turn their inventory over? Uh, this is kind of a fascinating one to really dig into businesses on. Uh, cost of goods sold divided by the average inventory. So our cost of goods sold is in our income statement at 148.8. Uh, our average inventory, once again, that's our average inventory. That's up on our balance sheet. We take 43,200 plus 38,400, divide that by 2. That's our average inventory for inventory turnover, which means it turns over, in this case, 3.64 times. Well, put it into simpleton terms, if we take that number, if we take 365 and divide it by our inventory turnover number, we get our days in the collection in the collection period and the turnover period. Um, in this case, it takes them 100 days to turn their inventory over. Uh, that's pretty impressive. And if, if you're a store like Target or Walmart, that's a very impressive number. Um, you know, and, and I think it's kind of neat to see. So what does it mean is it takes them, like I said, on average 108 days to sell its entire inventory.
Accounts payable turnover, how soon does it take them to pay their bills? So we take our cost of goods sold divided by our average accounts payable to get our accounts inventory. I'm sorry, uh, accounts payable turnover. Cost of goods sold is 148.8 for my income statement. My accounts payable is the average, so it's 114 divided by 220. My average accounts payable is there, so it's 8.22 times. Take that number, 365 divided by my accounts payable turnover equals the days in the payment period. And therefore, I get 44.4 days in the payment period. Basically, what it means is that it takes Swanson on average 44 days in the payment period to pay its bills. Now, that's good if they're getting terms of net. If they're getting terms of net uh, 60 or net 90, that's great. If they're getting terms of net 30, they're they're not uh, paying their bills on time. So.